the NIH continues to cover up its role in funding the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and maybe more we don't know. That comes to us from a new FOIA request from The Intercept. As well, all of this means that it didn't have to be this way. I'm convinced SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID, came from a lab, and I'm going to show you why. Let's go take a look. Dr. Chris Martin here with another episode. This one's going to be very explosive again. Look, it's really important that we get this right. Before we begin fighting over, do we need mandates? Should we have backs passports? How many people need to be locked down? What sort of rules? Should bank accounts be frozen? We have to understand where the shocks are coming from. We've got to widen out our frame of view. And we have to understand what is going on. Now, this is what I do in the world. So I'm going to show you some more data around the lab leak hypothesis, which is something it's no longer a hypothesis for me. We're up to theory now, which means that it's got lots of mountains of evidence. It would be up to the other side to prove that that's not the case. Now the ball's in their court. Uh, this is clearly coming from a lab, and as well, all fingers point to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. If you like being early, you're going to love my work. If you know me, if you've been following me, you know that I'm always way ahead of the pack. The pack being the major institutions out there, that would be the NIH, the CDC, as well as mainstream media. Now, how do I do that? I do that because I have a secret sauce. I got two things going in my favor. One, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I don't hold board seats in Pfizer. I don't have um, any, uh, you know, people above me that I have to worry about pleasing politically within a power chain of command that who knows, you know, gets murky. It's all about the money. So I don't have the monetary conflicts of interest. And two, I have a Comcast connection. I'm pretty sure that sets me apart because I don't know what's going on with these people who can't, like, read and figure stuff out, even though it's their job. They're in multi-billion dollar companies and institutions and organizations, and they don't somehow manage to, like, just read stuff and do their job. That's you, journalists, talking to you. And as well, that's all the major institutions which are busy crumbling, and I've lost so much respect. I really have none left for the CDC, the FDA, the NIH. These people are complicit in really bad outcomes that are very hard to explain through just simple negligence and incompetence. Always willing to be shown that's the case. I think it goes further than that. Let's talk about that now and let's go here. So today's episode, I want to talk about how I think COVID-19, the disease, was completely avoidable. Why? Because SARS-CoV-2 came out of a lab and by the way, didn't have to. We could, we humans could have not done that and that would have been awesome, which means it didn't have to be this way. Now, why do I care? Because if we can't get this right, we're going to get a lot of other things wrong. And there's some really big predicaments coming around the world. This is what I'm going to be talking about in part two of this for my subscribers back at Peak Prosperity, which is what does this mean around the Ukraine invasion, energy prices, mounting food, mounting food prices, inflation, uh, all these things. What do those have to do with this topic? Everything. Because bad decision making and bad narratives at one end of the spectrum usually means you got bad narratives, bad decision making at the other end of the spectrum. So let's go there. And my overriding concern for you is, come on, let's not be rats in a cage here. Rats in a cage, if you're not familiar with this framework, posits that, uh, built on all this research, I should say, that says that uh, if you put two rats in a cage and you shock them through their feet and they can't escape, because they can't figure out where the shocks are coming from, they end up identifying the other rat as the source of their pain, and so they fight. Now, how do you avoid being a rat in a cage? Well, this is where everything I do comes in, and where you come in as well is, it's this simple. What do we do? We educate ourselves on the true source of the shocks. And then you got to take action about that, right? Because there are ways to minimize what those shocks are. By the way, key word for this year is going to be resilience. The key ways we're going to get to resilience individually and as communities is first by educating ourselves, second by taking action. And the key steps in that are going to be forming communities of people who are like-minded and we have to come together. The people who can't get this, who won't get this, who don't want to get this, that's fine. They're going to have whatever outcomes they have. But for you, you really need to start thinking about how you're going to become more resilient. I need to think about that more too. I'm pretty resilient, but always could be more because things are coming that are, are pretty, pretty dark here. So instead of fighting like rats in a cage, like we see here, by the way, uh, probably can't see with that gas mask on, but that Canadian 
I'm not even sure what to call that. Is that a policeman? I don't even know what that is. No name badge, no identifying stuff, fully kitted out in thousands of dollars of unisuit with batons. But that mask probably is preventing him from seeing that he's stepping, walking on the Canadian flag right there. I'm sure, it's an oversight. But you can see the, the these uh, protesters down here. They just want to be heard. They're kneeling to, or taking a knee. And we're still treated pretty roughly um, by the Ottawa police who, well, they're going to have to live with that on their own. So maybe we should really be asking ourselves at this stage of COVID across all these different countries, why two years of our lives were lost and why so many people died? We really should be asking that. I think before we say, oh, you know, we can't lift the mask mandate and we're going to have to take a knee and the police are going to be beating and gassing us and riding over us with horses because the power structures, the Canadian government through that horrifyingly bad Justin Trudeau, what a terrible leader. Oh my God. I'm not going to give an inch. You guys, we're going to beat you, stomp you and do everything else besides just notice that there's no scientific rationale whatsoever for mask mandates. If Justin Trudeau put even one tenth of the effort into being curious about why we have this virus in the first place, maybe we'd get somewhere and maybe we could prevent that from happening again in the future and maybe even hold the people responsible accountable because that's the only way anything ever changes in this society. If people are not held to account, nothing changes. The old saying is power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely. What does that mean, absolute power? Well, absolute power is power without consequence. That's the king. The king can just stab a servant or do whatever they want and nothing happens. So guess what? Their behavior gets worse and worse and worse because that's a human trait. I would behave very terribly under absolute power. You would behave badly under absolute power. It's just how we're built. Let's not pretend we're any better. But let's also not pretend that leaders who do terrible things and people in positions of power who do awful things and don't have any consequences for that, let's not pretend that somehow they just, you know, magically will get better because they won't. Consequences. So this is a really cool article. Uh, Sharon Lerner, writing here for The Intercept, says uh, the NIH sent The Intercept uh, 292 fully redacted pages relating to virus research in Wuhan. Uh, this just comes to us February of 2022. Let me get my drawing tool out here. Yep. So uh, oh, didn't get it yet. Now I got it. All right. Uh, yeah, this just comes to us very recently here, February 20th. And the NIH continues to withhold critical documents that could shed light on the origin of the coronavirus pandemic. So let's go here. Um, opening paragraph from this. No, I think I pulled this a few paragraphs down. With the global death toll from COVID-19 approaching 6 million, the need to understand the origins of the pandemic is both pressing and grave. But the National Institutes of Health continues to withhold critical documents that could shed light on this question. This week, in response to ongoing litigation over public records related to coronavirus research, funded by the federal agency. The NIH sent the Intercept 292 fully redacted pages rather than substantive material that could help us understand how the virus first came to infect humans. Well, I'm going to help us understand that a little bit better, and we'll go there. Continuing on here in this article, quote, some of these releases have proven newsworthy. The grant proposals received in an initial batch of documents in September revealed that scientists working under the grant in Wuhan were engaged in what most knowledgeable experts we consulted described as gain-of-function experiments in which scientists created mutant bat coronaviruses and used them to infect humanized mice. The mutant viruses proved more pathogenic and transmissible in the mice than the original viruses. It's called gain of function. It's exactly what gain of function is. We're going to make this virus have better functions. It's going to gain the ability to better infect human cells. Um, that's exactly what it is. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, denied that the U.S. had funded gain of function work in Wuhan. <sighs> He's pulling one of those. Um, what What is the meaning of the word is? You know, it's a Bill Clinton moment. He's just, he's lying through his teeth. It's obvious. We all know that. He knows that. Everybody knows this. Um, so, of course, this is rather frustrating. 
Carrying on here in this article, I think the NIH is now hiding something. But of course, I do think that when people won't show something to you, that's the actual definition of hiding. No, you can't see my hole cards here in Texas Hold'em. I'm hiding them from you. That's how it is. All right, quote, but the most recent batch of documents which the NIH sent The Intercept on Tuesday underscores an ongoing lack of transparency at the agency, even as members of Congress and scientists, as members of Congress and scientists, call for additional information that could shed light on the origins of the pandemic. 292 of 314 pages. 292 of 314. More than 90% of the current release were completely redacted. Besides a big gray rectangle that obscures any meaningful text, the pages only show a date, a page number, and the NIAID logo. The remaining pages also contain significant redactions. So, this is what a page might look like. This is one that's not completely redacted. And so, we'll see here, you can see who it's from. You can see the date of this. So, this is April 15th, 2020, very early in the pandemic. They're already busy scrambling around this whole thing. This is a request for a call, FYI, urgent. Now, we're going to notice some things here. First, these are called B6 FOIA exemptions. I'll tell you what those mean in a second. This whole big gray area down here, that's a B5, okay? Um, All that's redacted. And then at the bottom, all we get to read is this, whatever this in that rest of it up there, this is for convenience, and I have some ideas waiting to hear back from Emily, and we'll set up time to talk to Jody tomorrow. So you'll we'll see a lot of these names uh, as you dig through the emails if you do that. Um, there's a lot of very familiar names in here. Emily, uh, very uh, responsible for gain-of-function kind of stuff inside the NIH and has yet to really account for what she was up to in this whole process. So let's first talk about exemptions B4 and B6. We'll see these today. B4 is an exemption pulled out when they feel like trade secrets and commercial or financial information obtained from a person and privileged or confidential inter- or intra-agency memorandums or letters would not be available by law to a party other than an agency in litigation with the agency. So it's trade secrets. You know, if they say, hey, you know, uh, we'd really like you to know about our proprietary and they're trying to, you know, companies communicating with um, the NIH around that, They would get a B4 around that. A B6 permits the government to withhold all information about individuals, personnel, medical files, similar files. So it would constitute an unwarranted invasion of personal privacy. So they felt pretty strongly that people's emails inside the government would represent too strong of an invasion of their privacy. Not sure I agree with that. Also, they didn't bother to redact the emails of people who weren't government employees. You can clearly see the the bias there. Like, oh, we're important. Um, Maybe not these other people. So that's pretty clear. Now, let's get to the famous B5 exemption. B5 is where all the action is. And Muckrock does a great job talking about this. This is an article all the way back from 2014. Um, This is awesome. Uh, The Federal Election Commission B5'd It argues that it can't tell you why it can't tell you what it can't tell you. (laughs) The FEC cited B5 exemption to withhold a B5 exemption guidelines. They're like, we're going to B5 what our guidelines are for when we use a B5. Cool, right? The only problem was uh, they had already posted those guidelines on their website. So (laughs) they were denied the ability to B5, the B5 explanations that had already been released publicly. Uh, But that's just how absurd this stuff goes, goes down. Um, so here's another example of, of a B5. This is a gem. So this got B5. This whole area down here, something was blocked out of this memorandum. And this was uh, this was about, um, uh, what was this? This was, yeah, this is a expressing the sense of the House of Representatives that Pakistan should be designated as a state sponsor of terrorism. So somebody wrote something down there or something happened. And so... Uh, Somebody fought to get this released, and it got released eventually. And what did they write there? They wrote, what a bunch of crap. That's that's what got B5'd. So the B5 uh, translates in government speak to, like, uh, anything that's slightly embarrassing, right? Writing, what a bunch of crap. Somebody said, well, that's embarrassing. We wouldn't want Pakistan to know that we think this, or we wouldn't want somebody to know that we write language like that because that's very undecorous. I don't know what. So that's what the B5 is. So here's how the B5... Um, 
Uh, again, uh, from Muckrock, uh, this is from 2018, they have a Sunshine Act kind of uh, activities there. And so they said, with Sunshine Week just around the corner, we want to count down the days to our favorite time of the year and take a closer look at what's going on behind the black bars. The nine federal FOIA exemptions, B1 through B9, exemption name B5. B5, here's the technical language on it. It exempts from disclosure inter- and intra-agency memoranda or letters that would not be available by law to a party other than an agency in litigation with the agency. So you could look at it as like, oh, B5 means that this is information, that there's already some sort of legal action around it. Nah, it's otherwise known as uh, the withhold it because you want to exemption. Now, anytime you just can't really think of a good reason you b5 it so why is that important because all those pages that were redacted looked like this here's some pages that were released (laughs) through foia uh, from a public agency which by the way the nih is not supposed to or shouldn't have any activities that are related to defense secrets um you know national security they're a health agency so for them to be five, this much material tells us they're just really embarrassed about something. Um, so 292 pages, pretty much just all B5. So that tells me they're hiding something. The NIH is hiding something, and they're hiding something that's related to, of course, whatever their involvement was with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Now, this is really important, germane information. You deserve an answer to it. The whole world deserves an answer to it. We all, the whole world, needs to know what exactly was going on in Wuhan at the Institute of Virology. And I think we do have a pretty good idea now. We do know. All right. So, um, by the way, in that uh, Intercept article, they did mention the main grant, which I'd looked up before. By the way, I'd pulled this up last year, and it was no problem. But today, when I went there for that um, grant number, which is this one here, ROIA110964 in Google, I, it came up, it was like no results. But not just like bad results. They were like, we, no, we got nothing. No results. But they did helpfully say, oh, maybe there was a space there. Your search didn't do this. D- did you mean one with a space in there? You know, how about that one? So sure. So I gave put the space in there and eh, that didn't help either. <laughs> Thanks, Google. But uh, all that tells me when, when Google won't give me a search result, I know what to do. You know what to do by now, hopefully. We all know what to do. And uh, what is that? Uh, you go over to DuckDuckGo. Um, and, of course, found something right away over on DuckDuckGo. So once we went into that grant, though, and we find this grant here, this um, 110964, when we look into that grant a little bit more, I, I reread it again today, and I found some stuff I didn't see before. So the list of all sub-awardees on this grant, right? So once you find the grant, you find out this is the grant that the NIH administered. They gave it to Peter Dazak, the EcoHealth Alliance. They funneled money to a variety of parties. Who are those parties? Those Some of them are called sub-awardees. One of them, of course, was the Wuhan Institute of Virology in yellow. So, yeah. Uh, we know that the NIH was busy shoveling money to EcoHealth Alliance, which was busy doing work with the Wuhan Institute of Virology. That's already an established fact. I know it's embarrassing, but hey, maybe we should put a little sunlight as disinfectant on that and take a quick peek at what's going on there because whatever went there really didn't work out well. Um, and so as they said here in this main grant here, the Wuhan Institute of Virology said, quote, this site is the main virology lab for the project. Not a lab, the main virology lab for the project. So it wasn't like this is a sub-awardee and we're just, you know, we're going to do a little work here and there and they've got some specialty expertise over here. This grant was going to be mainly conducted through the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Um, They say here, quote, they received field samples from sites in China and used sequencing to identify the presence of animal coronaviruses. They also characterized any isolated viruses to determine the host receptor binding and other in vitro and in vivo characterization. That's loaded sentence, that last part. We're going to do some other stuff. I'll show you what some of that was in just a second. But the thing I hadn't caught before was this. The Institute of Pathology and Bi- Pathogen Biology in China, quote, this site manages the human subject work to understand and study human exposure to animal coronaviruses, including the sampling, serology, and questionnaires administered after acute illness. So 
I didn't realize they were a sub-awardee too. Good question. Why is the NIH awarding money to the Institute of Pathogen Biology in China? Good question, right? Kind of cool to get the answer to that. And as well, in sort of a pinkish, brickish color down there, maybe matches my jacket today, uh, Duke NUS in Singapore, the collaborator at Duke NUS will act as a consultant on the project and provide her expertise on serological testing, virus characterization, PCR detection viruses. Her, Duke, this reminds me of what this work I did um, in 2021... Yeah, um, this is from September 2021 when I was looking at the key moments in the lab leak cover-up and noted that the Lancet here put on a COVID-19 commission to determine the origins, right? And it was a little awkward because they made Peter Daszak um, one of the task force members. In fact, he was the leading the whole effort for the Lancet. Way to go, Lancet. He's shredding all of your credibility. Hey, you did publish those fraudulent studies from Surgisphere. And you put together a task member to look into where these coronaviruses might come from. And you put on the committee, not one, but two of the direct rewardees from and subawardees from that main grant, including this woman down here, Danielle Anderson, who is scientific director of uh, ABSL3 Laboratory. That's the Duke and U.S. Medical School in Singapore and Australia. Um, she, I remember her name because... There was this MSN article that came out, and they wrote uh, Dr. Danielle Anderson, an Australian researcher who was reportedly the only foreign scientist to have conducted research at the Wuhan Institute of Virology's BSL-4 lab in the weeks leading up to the first known cases of COVID-19 were detected in China, has said what people are saying is just not how it is. She was very instrumental in throwing shade on the lab leak thing and pushing hard to make sure that people understood it might have had a nat probably had a natural origin when all of that. So um, here's a tip. You can't put people on an investigatory investigatory task force who are most likely in the culprit list or could even seem to be in the culprit list. You can't you can't do that. But the Lancet did. And of course, so did the WHO. Just just some of the awkwardness that that's happened of late. Of course, this is why I think all this is really actually was avoidable. Don't take the same people who created the disaster and then ask them to investigate themselves and come up with a conclusion as to whether they might have caused the disaster. You're never going to get an answer you want out of that. All right. So again, uh, as I mentioned, DuckDuckGo Duck, Duck, found this um, particular grant. No problemo. Came right up with it. There it is. Right there. Uh, R01AI110964. Remember, um, yeah, Google couldn't find it. It's just like, nah, we can't, there's, don't, don't know where that came from. So anyway, but Dr. Go found it. And when we look into this a little bit more, um, I guess I got to tell you this part of it. Um, so this is a bit of the, the side story. Here, here's where it gets interesting. This is, I'm doing my little investigatory, prosecutorial look into this thing. When I go here and I look into this um, book that came out a while ago, I believe this is 2015 book, go to chapter five. Kind of a boring title as they usually are in science speak. Efficient reverse genetic systems for rapid genetic manipulation of emergent and pre-emergent infectious coronaviruses. We see Cockrell, Beale, Yount, and Barrick, Ralph Barrick on there. Now, again, these are all people who've been monkeying around with coronaviruses good and hard. And what really caught my attention from this book was this figure that they put in here. Whoop, let me move this down again. Um, so what I'll, you'll note here is they're saying each of these along this timeline here that stretches out left to right. Back here in 2000, they say they created the first infectious clones uh, with coronaviruses. And there's the papers. You see Yount's name on there as a, pri as a primary author. This is in the year 2000. These are the first years they started to monkey around and create more infectious clones using this chimeric and genetic engineering technologies, right, where you take pieces from different coronaviruses and you put them together. A really, you know, strong, stable backbone and a receptor binding domain that tends to go into human cells. That was in 2000. Then in 2001, uh, Teal et al. Uh, were, you know, found a HCOV 229E infectious clone. So they're working out the cloning thing. And then MHV, the 859 infectious clone by Yount et al. in 2002. And then, oops, later in 2002 was SARS-CoV, the first time that thing just popped out 
Um, and then some more monkeying around with SARS-CoV infectious clones and doing some stuff with HKU1 and NL63 and they're finding the SARS-like back coronaviruses. And then, oops, 2012, MERS-CoV comes out. And then MERS-CoV and then there's um, these other two that pop out and then coming along until finally, if 2016, we'd have to go out to 2019 where SARS-CoV-2 pops out. The thing I noticed about this right away was that there were no pandemic, there were no pandemic coronaviruses prior to lab work beginning in the year 2000. So before these characters here began monkeying around in the lab and doing stuff and creating their fancy little chimeras, I'm sure it was very interesting, engaging work and all of that. And they built great careers off of it, got a lot of money and did things like that and, and um, uh, got all the things scientists want and need. <laughs> The nutrients for a scientist are giving talks and getting grants and, you know, having your having your ego stroked and all of that. But um, isn't that odd that we didn't have any the pandemics with these things before this crew started monkeying around with these things? Um, and by the way, same crew that was very instrumental in telling us convincingly, of course, all through 2000 that uh, this thing must have SARS-CoV-2 must have come from a natural origin and as well. A little help from Facebook and other friends who uh, banned any talk about lab leak or lab origin for this thing for all of 2020 and a good chunk of 2021. All right. This is from Drastic, the organization, um, and a collection of people. They had a whistleblower release of a DARPA grant that EcoHealth Alliance and Peter Dazak had submitted in 2018. And this is the defusal, defuse proposal from 2018. And what's really interesting in here is that what they did is um, went really so much further. That earlier uh, grant that we're seeing is actually from 2014. 2018, they'd learned so much more. And so what did they plan to do here? Well, you can see their little uh, graphical flow here. So they want to predict SARS-CoV um, jump potential. And so they're going to find these sars like things and coronaviruses. And then they're going to select some of them that have this human infection potential. They're going to look at the spike similarity there. Then they're going to create the spike trimer structures by adding some together. They're going to then screen for ACE2 interaction, human ACE2 interaction. Then they construct chimera, construct chimera viruses, best pieces. You know, it's like the best of, like, you know, greatest hits, right? And they put all that together, and then they evaluate expression in vitro and in vivo. Remember I said that term before? I can tell you about that. It's a very catchy little term. When they evaluate expression in vitro and in vivo, what they're really saying is we're going to be looking at um, how these things infect humanized mice. What's a humanized mouse? Well, they take the mouse, and they take its gene structure, and they take out a gene for ACE2, so it doesn't have a gene for ACE2 anymore. And then they take a human ACE2 gene and park it in that mouse. Now the mouse can live again because it has an ACE2, but it's a human ACE2 receptor. It doesn't have mouse anymore. So that's what they meant there. So that's what they were proposing to do. And from this proposal, which, by the way, DARPA refused to fund because they said this thing is nuts. I'm translating a little bit, but they're like, no, thanks. We don't like the look of this thing. And they were right to turn it down. Just set off their alarm bells. They said, let's not do this. I'm pretty sure this is the work that got done anyway, somehow. So reading all the way down through this uh, uh, proposal of theirs, look at this part here in green. After receptor binding, a variety of self-surface or endosomal proteases cleave the SARS-CoV-S glycoprotein, causing massive changes in S structure and activating fusion-mediated entry. Mouthful, what does it mean? Viruses are on the outside of your cell. They have to get inside. Here's the problem. Things can't just go into a cell. Those membranes are really tough and durable, and they've got a voltage potential on them, and they just keep things away like a two magnets. They're like, nope, you're not coming in here. So those membrane, how, the, for the virus has to defeat the membrane. That's what it has to get in. It has to figure out a way to get into or through that membrane. So one of the things is that furin cleavage site, that protease cleavage site, it needs that, and it needs that because that triggers a change in the S protein, a mechanical change that forces these two things together. So let's take a look at that. This is what it looks like. So we have a little GIF here, and this would be the down here would be the cell surface, and up here would be the virus particle, okay? And let's watch what happens as 
this, these two things, these are little, um, these would be the place that would get cleaved, in essence, these green structures right here by the protease. And so as it starts, it starts like this, the protease would cleave it. This folding happens, it pulls these two things together, and now the membranes have fused. So that clip happens, and then it pulls them together. And so the membrane, all those little white balls down there, those are phospholipids. This is like seen at like super, super duper magnification. Obviously, it's a computer mock-up, but um, that's what it would look like. So that's the whole process there. That's why you need, without, that, without those proteins going through that conformational change to pull those membranes together, they'll just be stuck there. It'll be bound to the receptor, but it's not getting in um, through this process. So they knew very early on that having these proteases, the furins, the cathepsins, the trypsins, those are proteases. They Proteases cut things. So the proteases would cut the proteins on the S protein, create that change, and then that would help drive this fusogenic process, as they say. All right, let's carry on. Uh, continuing in yellow, we will analyze, they proposed here, uh, all... SARS-CoV gene sequences for appropriately conserved proteolytic cleavage sites in S2 and for the presence of potential furin cleavage sites. Oh, remember in 2020 when I and other people were going, what's with that polybasic furin cleavage site? Let's look at the furin cleavage site. And, and all these virologists, including Dayzak, were out there saying, oh, you're nuts. Nobody, nobody would even suspect that. Nobody knew about those things. They did. Oh, yeah, they did. They knew all about them. They knew all about them here, and they were proposing to do them. And then they, they went on and said, oh, but nobody would have used that weird sequence that was found in there. But I'm going to show you that somebody had already thought of that sequence before, too. So it's all starting to stack up here. By the way, I'm going to give you Martinson's maxim. It goes like this. If somebody says they're going to do something, and then it happens, they probably did it. I know it's crazy, but that's how I live. <laughs> that's... That's my maxim. So uh, at any rate, the science is beginning to stack up. Here's a paper that just came out um, on 21st of February, 2022. So very recently, it's actually yesterday as, in terms of this recording. And uh, again, one of these funny big titles up here. Um, but really what they're looking at is they're looking at where did this furin cleavage site come from? A really nice piece of work here by these folks down here. Um, so we have Ambadi, uh, Barshne, Lundstrom, Paulu, Hall, Versky, and Brufsky. So um, you can see, you, here's the link down here. And at any rate, what they found was that the sequence that gives us that PRRA, the, the PRRA is the four amino acids, comes from a longer stretch of RNA that's in the virus. So the question is, where did that RNA come from? So they went into the, the larger, the system where the, all the genes of all the different organisms are kept. And they said, does anybody else have this? Because normally the way it goes is organisms don't make up brand new sequences on their own. They beg, borrow, and steal them from somewhere else. It's just how it is. It's much easier. It's very hard to come up with a new sequence that works. So uh, they often have to come from somewhere. So they said, well, is there another virus that has this exact sequence? And the answer is no. Nowhere do we find a virus with that sequence. Is there any other cell out there, squids even, something? Nope, we can't find anybody with that exact sequence. So they asked the question, where to come from? And here's the punchline from the end of this paper. It's a very complicated paper. I'll, I'll let you read it if you want. This is the string of letters here in the RNA that uh, code for that furin cleavage site. So they wrote here the absence of that string from any eukaryotic, uh, eukaryotes are, are bacteria are not eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are everything from amoeba to sperm whales. It's everything on, on our side of the branch, not the bacterial side. So the absence of that string from any eukaryotic or viral genome in the BLAST database, that's the huge database of all the genetic um, things that have ever been sequenced in the world, makes recombination in an intermediate host an unlikely explanation for its presence in SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> Makes unlikely. They're, they're downplaying that quite heavily. Uh, it's good science speak. You, you, you make sure you're, you make fully defensible statements. It's not just unlikely. It's closing in on impossibly unlikely. So the question, though, is, is there, does that string of letters actually appear anywhere? I just told you it doesn't appear in the eukaryotic cells, but the answer is, yeah, you can find that string of letters. You can find it in one place. 
Um, you can find it in a string of patents by Moderna Therapeutics. Um, you've probably heard of that company. Of course, they make the mRNA vaccine, and they were able to produce that very, very quickly. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, and this is a synthetic construct. So this right here would be the kind of thing where if we lived in an attack functioning culture, there would be powerful people like senators and congressmen and, and, and prosecutors and whatever saying, we need to have an answer to this. We need to understand how it is that your patented string of letters, Moderna, managed to make it into this pandemic virus over here. That would be a really cool thing for us to understand. We need to understand that. Was it random chance? Because if it was, we need to understand how that random chance came about. If it wasn't random chance, we need some answers. Um, so that's uh, where that study goes. Now, this was from a May 4th, 2020 update. I was directing journalists back then. Always be looking at the PRRA. This is that polybasic furin cleavage site. It's this little string, excuse me, right here. It, it's missing in all the other closest relatives. It's just missing. It's an insert. It's not like some letters got scrambled and changed. It's an insert. Inserts, that was the smoking gun for me that when I went and looked at this back in May 4th, I was like, these people here, this main paper written by Christian Anderson here was full of junk because it was in nature and they tried very hard to argue really early on in this whole thing back in early 2020. I know it says 17th of March, but they wrote this paper within a few days after that famous meeting with... Um, NIH, Collins, and, and Fauci and all of that. And they said, oh, this thing had to have come from nature. I'm like, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. You didn't account for this furin cleaver site. And they said, oh, well, you know, there's there's some other viruses that have that, not with that string of letters. And they knew it. And they knew it. And they knew it. And they knew it. Because um, that's their job. If I knew it, and that wasn't my job, they could have known it. But maybe they didn't have a Comcast connection. You know what I mean? At any rate, um, May 1st as well, I was just like, please, 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 everybody just watch out for that PRA thing because um, it's really important. Now, this thing is lab-made. I'm 99.99% I'm positive about that at this point in time. By May 12th, I'd already figured out you know, a possible method for this, which I actually, now that I reviewed it a couple years later almost, I'm going to say, yeah, this seems about right. Um, they had a backbone of some kind from some virus. Their thing, maybe it's the RATG13. Maybe it's different. I'm, I'm not so sure about the provenance of rat G13, but we'll see. But they had some, they had a starting point. They had something that they used as the backbone. And then they, I think they put the pangolin receptor binding domain because it has perfect alignment with the actual one that we're facing right now. And then they added this polybasic furin cleavage site. They cycled it over and over and over again in cell culture. It's always possible that this polybasic furin site came from um, its exposure to this cell culture here. And possibility. And this, of course, amplifies the gain of function. And then I think they put it into animal models. It could have been ferrets, could have been mice, could have been both. I don't know. But um, here it is now. And and this is this is the world we live in. I still think this is pretty close to what happened. Again, how is it possible that I figured this out in May of 2020? And even now the world is you know still struggling to get anything from the NIH. Like, do you guys know anything? They're like, B5. <laughs> it's just... They're guilty as all get out. But isn't it kind of weird? I got to ask this. Isn't it kind of kind of weird that the very same outfit that's blocking inquiry into the source of COVID is the same organization that blocked all use of and inquiry into early treatments? I mean, as of even this morning, if you go to the NIH website for treatment guidelines on COVID, it still says there's really nothing we can do on an early basis. They've got some monoclonal antibodies. Maybe they'll use remdesivir early now on an outpatient basis, and they're looking at putting in maybe some other stuff from from Merck and, and from Pfizer. But but it's, but we had so many other things. They still don't have a point of view on vitamin D. How is that even possible? How how is how is it possible that the NIH has given us B five on the one side about where this came from, and can't come up with an opinion about vitamin D on the other side with mountains of evidence? Isn't this their job? But if this isn't their job, what is their job? What are they doing? Uh, so at any rate, um, if you wanted to defund something and really make an impact, don't defund the police, defund the NIH, uh, because that's the only way you ever get somebody's attention. There has to be a consequence. There has to be a consequence. There has to be a consequence for being this evasive and this bad at your job, if you think that's your job. So that's where I am on that. Um, by the way, we are uh, going to go over to part two two now and this is over going to be found over at my website i'm going to be talking about how this whole thing where it's now time to put your resilience preparations in overdrive because there's all kinds of stuff going on now and it is uh 
things are getting pretty, pretty interesting out there. We got Ukraine going on. We've got, of course, inflation raging. Wait till you see what's going on in the energy space. All of this combines, including with the idea that maybe there's going to be a generalized trucker strike um, and or, you know, the people who are being sort of not sort of, but the people who are being oppressed who actually do all the work in the society uh, might uh, decide to, to go on some sort of a, a walk away uh, from their jobs and all of that. So you put all of these things together. It's a huge period of change. And it's very clear that there's an agenda running out there right now. It's very, very clear that all of us have to be prepared for the idea that things are about to change really strongly, disruptively. So this is what I'm going to be talking about over here um, later as uh, you follow over at Peak Prosperity. Why and what? What are these preparations we talk about? Um, And so that's really all I have for you today. But just to remind you, hey, this is what I do in the world. I find stuff early. I find it before other people find it. Again, it's very easy. I don't have conflicts of interest, and I care a lot about figuring these things out. And so that's what I do for all of my subscribers who support all of my effort and my team over at Peak Prosperity. We figure out stuff and get it to you early because we think that information And education that's actionable is actually the most important stuff today. So if you come to Peak Prosperity, become a subscriber, I'm your personal information scout. I'm out there every day trying to figure out what's going on in the world. This is what I dedicate all of my time to because you don't have time for that. I do. So that's what I do and um, love to have you come on by, become part of the tribe because, well, banding together is going to be one of the most important attributes for this year and next. So... That's where we are in all of this, and um, it's been great talking with you again today. It didn't have to be this way. 